get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of P90X, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, dentists, coaches, you name it, stop just trading time for dollars and shift from a one-to-one client work to a one-to-many. Uh, Rise25 is an exclusive accountability and group coaching program, and who want to scale up and it's run by myself and by my founder, co-founder, John Corcoran. We bring together like-minded entrepreneurs from different client serving backgrounds. A lot of times people love Ben, the, um, we have a dream product ladder, which is a download on our rise 25 site. And it basically helps any business kind of design their business on one sheet of paper and see untapped revenue potential there. So a lot of people go there, download your free dream product ladder, and I'm excited to introduce today's guest. We have Ben Arnenberg, and he co-founded two quickly growing seven-figure e-commerce companies, Willow and Everett and CubeFit. And what's, what's even more impressive, Ben, as you know, because you live this, but he did this <laughs> all by working full, while he was working full-time in the United States Air Force, helping to develop some cutting-edge space technology. So, Ben, thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks so much, Jeremy. It's a pleasure to be here. I always like to include a fun fact. And so Uh-oh. Ben has skydived over 500 times and can also juggle flaming torches. That's, that's, <laughs> but not, that's at not at the same time. Not at the same time. Yeah. That, that's good. Be <laughs> safe out there. Um, so, Ben, I'm excited to chat. And first of all, I want to talk first about how did you get started? How did you get interested in this e-commerce journey? Because you're... Give, like, kind of take me back to that time. You were you're in the Air Force, right? Working full time. Mm-hmm. What gets you interested in e-commerce? So I've always been interested in entrepreneurship, and you know, always had those leanings. Um, and once I uh, so, so went to the Air Force Academy, graduated, and my first assignment was to go to grad school. So while I was there, I you know really wanted to kind of just test out some startup things and. I heard about an organization called Three Day Startup where we got to basically make a startup in a weekend. And it was an amazing experience. We ended up doing a pivot and launching this mobile app in the healthcare space that mm. was picked up as a president's challenge finalist at, um, in this Harvard challenge. And we had we got residency at Harvard's Innovation Lab through that. And just like a lot of awesome resources. And, you know, for a while, kind of living the, quote, startup dream, mm. if you will. But like most high-flying tech startups, it's really difficult to pull it off. So I had to basically separate from that startup to go down for my next Air Force assignment. And I was left kind of feeling disillusioned. Like, man, you know, entrepreneurship is, it, it's awesome, it's sexy, but you either make it in your, big and you're Mark Zuckerberg or you just completely fail and nine out of 10 fail. So I, I just thought like, man, I'm, this is just isn't going to work for me. But as I was doing my, my Air Force job, I, I kept thinking like, I love entrepreneurship. I'm you know, passionate about it. So I started exploring you know, some different business models out there and heard actually uh, on Ryan Moran's podcast, Free and Fastlane, talking about this e-commerce business model and thought, hey, that sounds like it would be kind of fun. And it doesn't sound too difficult, you know, not impossible or anything. And so I was like, I think I'm going to give that a shot. So yeah. Um, yeah, decided to try that out in 2014. So I want to go back and talk about Heligram. That was the, that was the startup, right? What yeah. were some of the learnings there? Because I don't want to over, you know, overstep this. Because it's important, you probably had a lot that you learned. Some things worked, some things didn't work. Yeah, yeah. And what was your experience there? What worked, and what do you take from there and go, okay, I got to do this differently in my next uh, company? Yeah. I, so the biggest thing is in that entire company, we were essentially a solution looking for a problem. We mm. kind of we came up with this like really cool idea, this really cool technology, and you would talk to a few even you know doctors about it, and we're starting to line up some. Uh, so basically, the the premise of the app is it allows doctors to remotely monitor patients' wounds healing, and it was a pivot from a previous idea we had for an app 
of kind of like a time lapse of people aging, which was a really stupid idea. But we thought, hey, what if we did this time lapse in the medical field and could kind of watch as, mm. you know, the doctors, you know, watching these things heal over time yeah. and save us a bunch of money. They don't have to go into the doctor, et cetera, et cetera. But talk about the pivot for a second, though, yeah. because that's an important well, point. Like oftentimes yeah. companies start off in one direction, even if it is a good idea, and pivot to something's even better, right? So the initial idea, what caused the pivot? Uh, so initially the pivot was caused by, we, and, and through this and something I also learned, I learned a ton from this experience. You know, they say you learn more from your failures and mistakes than you do from your wins. But um, one of the things we did really well was trying to follow the whole lean startup model. So we were on the ground, you know, just getting out there in Boston, talking to people on the street saying, hey, what do you think of this like time-lapsing app idea? And a lot of people are like, ah, it's okay. It's kind of cool, but I wouldn't pay for it. So we quickly determined this is not a great idea. But then we made that pivot into the medical space because a few guys on the team had medical connections. One was uh, like Harvard Dental School. So we thought like, hey, this is this could have a lot of uh, potential. Started talking to some actual doctors and um, decided to kind of build it out from there. But we never really truly were able to validate like this is a you know bleeding neck problem as like a Perry Marshall would say like this is something that needs to be solved now it was kind of like ah that might be cool and there's just a lot of red tape in the healthcare space as well um so yeah so a lot, a lot of hurdles but the biggest mm -hmm. one I would say is there wasn't a clear defined problem that we were really solving or we, we had a conjecture of what that was but no one was necessarily begging for it at that moment yeah so when you pivoted, you were pivoting towards more of a pain point. I mean, it sounds like you were doing the right things of talking to the customer base and validating it. Right. Um, so what was the issue? Like why there wasn't another pivot where you actually found it? It just was a time thing. Uh, so, so partially and what ended up happening is, is I, I had like my, my time was up, so to speak with the grad school assignment. Air Force was like, all right, you got to go down to Washington, D.C., so I left those guys and then they went and took it to an accelerator in New York. And I think it's actually now, I think finally slowing down. Like there was maybe at one point going to make it. I, I don't think it is, but um, just a lot of, I guess, complexity for coming up with something that is untested. Um, and I guess from that experience, it made me much more interested in finding business models, yeah. at least for now that are a little more probable. So you're not going to be like, a billionaire from them, but you have a good chance yeah. that you can make a pretty, you know, pretty nice business out of it. You know, the cash flow businesses, so to speak. So that's where I really like e-commerce yeah. and playing in that space now. But then using it as a breeding ground to launch innovative products um, and, and go from there. Yeah, yeah, and I like that. It's a a lot of times thinking of it as a a problem, like solving a problem first, and especially if it's a bleeding neck problem, then that's even you know you're you're really providing a solution that people want, right? Yeah, and I mean, and, and to that, I think there are so many problems in the world and so many startups that I've seen, especially those like fresh out of college, like super idealistic students who are like, oh, we're going to change the world. We're going to do this thing because it sounds cool. And they don't really do their homework to like really, really, really try to validate the problem or go out there and approach it totally different. Hey, let's learn as much as we can about all the problems out there and then let's like back it out and build a solution. So many right. do the complete opposite. I, you know, I think it's kind of rampant especially in those like idealistic student yes. bubble, Silicon Valley, et cetera. hundred percent. Like when John and I uh, at Rise 25, we joke when we're talking to people is like, if you ask us a question, we say the same thing every time, which is ask your customer, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> you know, like what should we charge? I don't know. Ask your customer. What should we do? What should we add to this product? I don't know. Ask your customer, you know, and it comes down to that. And, and honestly, that advice is, it's so simple, but it's so easy to forget. And, I even have to remind myself of this frequently, but as an example, we did this for one of our products, one of our teapots. I just started asking every new customer, like, hey, what do you like most about this product and what can we do better? And I was amazed at the incredible quality of feedback we got to not only allow us to then position it better in the marketplace, but then to continue making iterations. Just, it's so simple, but I think so many mm -hmm. entrepreneurs overlook it. Yeah. So this takes me, and I'm really fascinated by this. One, um, you know, how you did the e-commerce. You're, you're working full-time in the Air Force, jumping out of planes or whatever you're doing. I guess you're developing, <laughs> jumping out of planes, developing space technology. Um, how you did that. And I also want to talk about, you know, we're on the, the bleeding neck problem, you know, in your companies. I want to know how you research on what the next product is going to be. Um, so start with the, how'd you do this full time? You know, you're, you're doing full time in the Air Force and starting these two, people have a hard enough time starting one 
seven figure business or any seven figure business and you're doing this while working full time in the Air Force? So yeah, de- definitely started with a lot of baby steps at first and um, you know, scaling from there. Um, but yeah, so it started with actually uh, started a fitness brand in e-commerce space. Bad, bad product choice. The company didn't really work out, but I th- thought, hey, there's still something here. So I got my wife on board. We said, let's make a brand out of things we like doing. You know, there's no yeah. better customer than yourself. What was so the first make- product that didn't work? You okay, said, so the first yeah. pro- I'm almost embarrassed to say it was it was pretty silly. It, it was really kind of like following a trend. It was these calf compression sleeves supposed to okay. you know, help running and health. And we we thought like, hey, let's make a, a minor innovation and put like reflective stripes on the calf sleeves when For people are running at dark. Mean? Yeah, uh-huh. but honestly, you know, talk about I should have learned my lesson from uh, you know Helogram and really validate it. We did a little bit, but not enough. People didn't care. Um, so mm. we decided with, I don't think that's that make, embarrassing. I thought you were going to say something way worse. Oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I guess the yeah, interesting thing too, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners, you know, can maybe attest. I feel like there's this fine tension between going after like super sexy, high tech startups that have, um, you know, like you're like really excited about and proud to be saying you're working on, but probably are going to flop versus like I'm just selling toothbrushes, you know. What I mean, you know, but like I'm making a really good living doing it. So I feel there's that a tension. need for it, but yeah, it's yeah, not exactly. like saving the world, right? Maybe right, gingivitis exactly. world, but yeah, um. yeah. right. So I, yeah, I've, but with um, so we decided my wife and I to start this brand out of um, just what we we're passionate about. We love coffee, we love tea, hosting people. So just kind of made this lifestyle brand, Will and Everett, out of that. And any product we launched, made sure it scratched our own itch. It was high quality, what we would want to use. But over time, I did become a student of systems and then outsourcing. And 8020, uh, Perry Marshall's book, influenced me a lot, the 8020 yeah. sales and marketing. Because as we scale, there's just way too many tasks. And on top of that, I'm working full time. This all started off as an experiment, and it grew so fast to the point where I was able to do it full time, but I still had a commitment to the Air Force. So I literally I could not you know, leave it and do this full time. Um, so it just became about becoming as efficient as possible. So like I said, systemizing everything, focusing on those high level tasks, getting everything else off my plate. Um, and then with the second business, CubeFit, uh, which is our healthy office products business, it was finding a really awesome uh, couple to be our partners for that and then kind of replicating the success, the systems of Willow and Everett. And what we found for you know one of the biggest levers to pull is selling everything primarily through Amazon.com because then we could use all their fulfillment, yeah. their sales channel. It, we found it was a very quick way to scale and that we could continue focusing on finding, um, creating, curating awesome products and taking care of the customer. Yeah. Do, you know, doing it on a marketplace as opposed to trying to sell it all yourself. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. how did you systemize? What are so, some of the things you did? Yeah, absolutely. So a big fan of uh, Work the System by Sam Carpenter and making um, standing operating procedures. Uh, actually, Tim Francis, who you've had on Shout the show. Shout out to Tim Francis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. His, uh, you know, read some of the stuff he put out there. Uh, yeah. So j- just like really phenomenal material. So yeah, just, you know, we ended up making a lot of standing standard operating procedures for our business. We have over... 50 70 now we have a lot and i'm um, having you know then starting to hire help really learning how to get get a team scale it let them make the sops and run almost everything in the company that um you know yeah. that they can run we even so. have a page dedicated to tim france like uh there was actually you know riceway5.com i think it's slash tim francis where we share his story but he there was an actual ink article written on tim from one of our retreats of it was caught up basically what you're saying, the lean startup, how to pivot like a pro and how he pivoted on mm. an idea and created this whole new business just by listening to feedback. So that's really that's interesting. Awesome. Yeah. So work the system, Tim Francis, what did you actually implement from learning from Tim Francis? So you started to create systems documents. It sounds like what else, did, what did you do? Yeah, exactly. Yep. So system documents, um, making a company internet site, linking everything together in Google docs, just so it was quickly scannable uh, and then having a combination of uh, VAs like outside the U.S. in the U.S. handle you know logistics, operations, yeah. customer service, marketing, um, and then yeah, like I said, just trying to divide as much of that out as possible, and then just kind of orchestrating it because the time was so limited. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was also fantastic. My wife was able to quit her job and come and join me. She also does wedding photography, so she's kind of doing both. But it was yeah. awesome to have her on board because she's definitely the marketing brand 
force behind uh, the company. This is, you know, I don't want to jump over this either, Ben, because this is important to talk about the VA piece, right? You say yeah. it very nonchalantly, but some people have a very hard time finding and delegating specific tasks and even keeping those those VAs. So yeah, how did you have success count. with attracting the right VAs? And then what did you have them actually doing for you? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question because I've definitely also um, had my share of mistakes in this place was literally like one day away from hiring someone who had, as I found out later, declared bankruptcy and stolen money from a previous employer. So <laughs> how'd you, you, know, just, how'd you about, realize that? Um, so ended up, you know, deciding to run and, and you know, part of this is that balance between, you know, lean startup doing things as fast as you can, but then making sure you put enough like checks in place that you're not doing something that will destroy the whole company. Yeah. So it's like a really fine balance. But in this case, my accountant was like, hey, you should maybe at least run a background check on that person you're going to hire and talk to some of the references. And I was just trying to go as fast as I can. I was like, that's a really good point. Um, so I, I, you know, I think for this process, it's it's trying to learn as much as you can. What are the best practices out there? Yeah. What we found is for VAs, at least based overseas, really like using a headhunting service called Virtual Staff Finder. For um, mm -hmm. Filipino VAs, they're pretty fantastic. And then for the U.S., um, I really like making uh, or kind of dove into making hiring funnels. So basically, you try to have people go through as many hoops as possible mm -hmm. before even spending time on an interview with them. So mm -hmm. trying to get like you know 100 people in the funnel, then narrow it down. Yeah. Uh, but but I guess just you know I, I after some mistakes, try to become a student of learning as much as I could about those funnels. And and I think it's really about finding good. Um, resources or not resources but um you know where where is everyone hanging out that you want to attract so the two methods are either go out and poach them it's a lot more difficult especially when you don't have a company that people recognize or know yet or you go to these fantastic sources hire my mom.com being one of them i know tim francis talks about them a lot and they're awesome and then also i found angel.co is pretty great because you have a lot of people that want to work for startups there mm, and they that's also do remote work yeah so we found for one of our uh, marketing musicians, just in a, like incredibly high quality leads. And right now we have our, all of our company uh, virtual, although I think I'd like to, for these companies or future ones, try to do a lot of that in-house because I think there is a lot more synergy, camaraderie that occur from that. But at the time, you know, with a full-time job, I couldn't have them in-house. So we just had it all out around the world. Yeah, thank you for sharing that because I know some of those resources are just huge. If even one of those, someone just checks them out that can be game changing for someone's business. Um, yeah. So yeah, you have to 80, 20 things, you have to delegate things, you have to create systems or you can't do both at the same time. So it's almost, it was like a blessing in disguise uh, for you to be so busy. I, you know? So I, yeah, my, my wife pointed that out. She's like, you're actually really fortunate that you've like, it was a forcing function. Like I think I would have gotten a lot lazier. And, and so actually I was in, the, I, I was trying to join the reserves and get out even earlier. And I ended up getting denied from that attempt. And at that point, I said, all right, I made this list of like, these are ways I'm going to save even more time. It's a little ridiculous, but one of them was yeah. I vowed I was going to take Ubers everywhere and work in the back of the car on my laptop when instead of wasting time in the car, I ended up not doing that because my wife wouldn't let me or, you know, strongly discouraged me from doing that. But there is, uh, you know, so some, what are some others, yeah. Ben, what are some other time savers that you actually use on a daily basis? I'd love to hear them. Yeah. So I, and I guess the, the thing, though, is I'm. You know, now, okay, I can finally be a full-time entrepreneur. I can kind of, you know, what, what do I want my life to look like? And I, I don't want to be someone who just maximizes throughput. I'm just the most productive human ever. I think there's a lot more to life <laughs> than just getting stuff done. You Tim know what Francis, I mean? like, don't listen to this. You will not approve. <laughs> no, so that, that's actually a question I'm, um, I'm really, like, internally, like, kind of wrestling with. Like, what, you know, what do I want my life to work with? Mm. Um you know, I'm a Christian, so God, how can I honor God with my life? How can I be a good husband to my wife? You know, there's a lot of things that don't yeah. really have a measurable ROI yeah. but are so important to even what it means to be a human. So I'm kind of now, like, realizing, whoa, I went a little off the deep end with my insane efficiency. And I told this to my wife. I'm like, relationships are the most inefficient thing on earth. But they're also, I think, one of the most necessary, like, what we're you know, made for. So... Um, so yeah. as far as time saving right now, when I'm working, I try to be, you know, 
batch your email, check it once in the morning, once in night, use boomerang, you know, kind of, I guess some of the common when tactics. When do you check oh, it in the morning and evening usually? Um, so I'm a big fan of the one thing, which is mm -hmm. something that I highly recommend reading. Yeah. Uh, I interviewed with author, one of the co-authors. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, the one, so that also has changed, um, my life. I would say the business because, you know, when I get up, I spend usually two to three hours just focusing on what are my top level tasks right now. And then yeah. after that, I'll check my email, um, you know, maybe mid morning. Yeah. Inspired insider Jay Papison. You can, you can check out the interview. Yeah. Oh, anyone out okay. There. I, yeah. I will have to listen to that as well. Yeah. I, yeah. So I, really I agree. Like yeah. So what else, what else has saved you a ton of time business wise? So you batch it, uh, yep. batch your email. Yep. Batch email. Um, personally, I, I try to make sure I'm still working out, you know, three or four times a week. Just that helps me stay sane of sound mind. Um, I try to limit my hours as well. Try to take off like all day Sunday and work not very much on Saturday either. Cause I find that the more I'm recharging, the more fresh I am just to get after things. And also I think it's harder to make yourself do those really high value tasks. You know, the one thing, like what's the one thing you can do such that everything else is unnecessary? I think if you're in this constant, like running around the hamster wheel doing 60 hours a week, you almost don't even have time then to think about what are my high, most high value tasks. And, you know, it's the whole notion of, you know, being busy isn't the same as being productive. Um, so the more time you build in, I think the more yeah. time you have to focus. And this is something I'm still learning because I've only yeah. been full time for literally three months. Maybe you should go back day, to not full time. You're like, I'm just getting another job so that I have to force within those hours. Yeah. But oh, so then another one other thing is yeah. I think this is pretty brilliant. Once a month, sit down and say, what are all the tasks I've done this last month that are unnecessary? Write them all out and then say, yeah. what can I either eliminate? What can I outsource? Um, you know, what should I keep doing? But that also has really helped help me identify things that I'm doing every day that, okay, I should probably have one of our employees or VAs yeah. do this. Because we get into a, you know, we just get into what's normal. So, what are some th some of those things that you did eliminate or delegate? Uh, okay, so uh, you know, even simple things like setting up an email campaign, and you know, now having our um, marketing person like you know curate and run those. But in the beginning, it was like, hey, I can probably sh you know shave off ten minutes by having our VA build this in Mailchimp versus me having to go in there and do it. Um, so I guess it's just little, yeah, little things like that of anything that someone else can do that's going to save yeah. you even a few minutes, do it because it's going to compound and save you a lot of time. What's something, Ben, that you would have thought, you know, six months ago, there's no way I'm the only one who should be doing this. I'm the only one who could do this. And now it's not on your plate anymore. Because sometimes it's easy to see, okay, like, yeah, I should obviously not be whatever, calling a customer service person and spending an hour on the phone on wait. But sometimes it's the things that we clo hold so close. Like for instance, yeah. people outsource the whole email. Like some people are like, no, I want to be the one responding. What was something for you that you felt I need to be the one to do this, that you actually ended up taking off of your plate? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, Maybe there isn't one right no, now. No, Yeah. So I think when we were launching new products, I kind of kept myself as point on um, making sure it was on track and then really pushing to make sure it was launched. And what I noticed was like, as we continue for our company, this, like, I can't be the You're one the kind of running point on new products. Yeah. And just like trying to like maintain, you know, on like what part is, you know, where it needs to be and, you know, making sure everything's on track. So what we did was we ended up listing every single step, you know, soup to nuts of launching a product, you know, like a 50 item document. And now I have our marketing manager run that in conjunction with a few other um, employees, VAs, and they just, just give me status updates on it. But that's, that's been a huge stress relief that when we, you know, I kind of still help curate, you know, invent, you know, get the product ready, you know, as far as like, okay, now we're going to order it. But then they take and run the whole thing. And six months ago, I, I don't, don't think I ever would have maybe thought I could trust someone to to run that process. Yeah. So it's really breaking it down into the small pieces so that you yep. can maybe focus on one of those pieces that is your natural superpower. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Any other softwares uh, or things you use to be have time savers? Like one thing I use is. Um, yeah. I use Enounce. I don't know if anyone's heard of Enounce. It's a desktop app that speeds up all of your audio video on your computer uh, up to three times. So just slider pops up 
and you can just push the slider. So if you want to listen to something on YouTube and any any on any website, it will you can speed it up. So with research and things. So oh. um, I'm wondering one of those things that you do that I should be doing also, or anyone um, else should be doing. What like what do you have on your I don't know your your phone? What do you use software wise on a daily basis to be more efficient or to help save time? Yeah. So I mean, I guess one of the things <laughs> I guess, this doesn't really answer your question, but I try to simplify and cut as much as I can. So for example, like I try to not check my phone very often I'll reply to text even once a day maybe kind of like batch it I use an extension of my computer so I can type it out because I hate having to like thumb on it I check Facebook maybe once a week like I guess it's just like eliminating all as much stimuli as possible yeah. and then continually focusing on what's most important um and you know how am I am I running my team while I'm managing them while we setting good vision um but maybe like a practical tool is boomerang I'm not sure if you I use uh, followup.cc so oh, okay. Is it pretty sim similar? I don't know if it's similar or not, but I, I've heard it is. Okay. But yeah. Yeah. That's smart. Uh, but yeah, that's the, I guess that's the big one that comes to mind. Eliminate, not add, is, is your message here, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, exactly. you know, you mentioned something. Um, you know, you have whatever, a 50 plus step document that you broke down with the launching product. Because two of the questions I have is I want to know how you research new products. And then mm -hmm. second is then how you launch those products. And I thought maybe we'd start with, you've had a lot of success on Kickstarter. Um, if anyone hasn't checked out, I mean, I your CubeFit site is a special place in my heart, Ben, because ah. <laughs> I find that sitting stagnant is a silent killer for people, human beings. You know, yeah. and... and um, I really think you know some of those products help with that, like the standing desk, the ergonomic standing desk mat, and you know the Kickstarter was yeah. the CubeFit Terra mat, which is the ergonomic standing desk mat. So I'm I'm wondering how you came to that product, and then actually, you know, the, the, I think I'm not sure how much you you wanted originally, but I think it did over $108,000 um, in for that Kickstarter. Yeah, it went it went really well, and I have to give my business partner Gerald a lot of props for that because he spearheaded that effort. And honestly, in the beginning, I was kind of like, "Ah, is this even worth our time?" But you know, I was like, "All right, let's do it," and it it went fantastically. But we learned a few things by doing that, kind of the eighty twenty levers of yeah. crowdfunding, I guess you could say. And we're actually taking what we learned there and have a Kickstarter in the works for Will and Ever right now that we think should do at least as well as the uh, the TerraMat did. Um, but yeah, and this is a, this is a, something I'm very passionate about is I saw our success of how well the Terramat did on Kickstarter. And then we were able to take that and generate lots of consistent sales after the Kickstarter occurred, um, through Amazon and our website. So I think for a lot of e-commerce companies, there's a tremendous opportunity. If you have a product that is, um, unique or at least resonates with customers of doing the Kickstarter because it creates such an amazing halo effect that is, I think, severely underestimated. Like what I was blown away is like, you know, I think three weeks into the campaign, I Googled standing desk mat, a fairly competitive keyword, and we were on the front page of Google, our Kickstarter was. So wow. there's so much traffic that comes from that um, that you don't even expect. It, it can really help catapult a, a product. Um, so anyways, it's, it's worth people who out there might have, you know, these companies considering, especially as a strategy into generating consistent sales. What a uh, problem I see is, people that do these crowdfunding campaigns, they really don't have a game plan after the fact. Like, hey, what am I gonna do now that I raise all this money? I mean, because, forget about that. Like, they probably, yeah. most people don't have a game plan before, probably, you know, like, <laughs> let alone yeah. after. I mean, game plan to launch True. the Kickstarter. Yeah, sure, and, and if you want, I could kind of give some like, Yeah, go ahead, tell me the game plan before and the game plan after. Yeah, sure, so I, at the end of the day, as I'm finding out with, with even you know any anything in in business and you know e-commerce specifically it really comes down to the product like do you have a good product now like you could follow all the right steps and if your product just people don't care about it yeah. then you probably shouldn't do a crowdfunding campaign and maybe even bring it to market so that you know is partial response to your other yeah. question like how do you even yes. buy products so start there um, so why the okay. economic standing desk mat then yeah so what we like to do is i like to find 
demand in the marketplace. Um, I I think it's fun to release a product no one's heard of before that is like super innovative, but it's also incredibly risky. As our company's gotten more mature, has better cash flow, we've been able to do some kind of hybrids of, I'll call them evolutionary products, not revolutionary, mm. but revolutionary is extremely risky and difficult yeah. unless you're a more established company with a lot of R&D. So what we like to do is kind of this sweet spot of evolutionary and we use um, various software to kind of establish demand so it's uh, you know a little bit of a science and an art, but yeah. we can find okay you know what's selling well out there in the marketplace. What do you even notice is popping up in stores? What do you you know we look at Google Trends a lot, like okay where are there like spikes occurring, um, and then you know we look at Amazon data, what's selling well on Amazon, and then what we do is we say okay now that we kind of see where there's some strong demand, how can we make what exists better? How can we bring more value to the customer, make something, um, you, you know, a lot more enticing for them. So that's kind of how we work it backwards. So what you then want to do is if you think you have a product that is going to have high demand, you want to test a Kickstarter before you actually do a Kickstarter. This is, I think, like mm. the holy grail and something I'm actually passionate about helping others who have innovative product ideas do as part of like a side project I have called Product Fuel. But the idea is that you... Um, can run, you know, just simple landing pages, drive really targeted traffic, and then start looking at your cost per lead. Mm -hmm. And if your cost per lead is within a, a, a good range, it means this Kickstarter is probably going to work. So, for example, Will and Everett was considering this like super, you know, nice design, temperature control kettle, and I thought it might make a good Kickstarter. But we ran some, you know, some validation ads for it, and the emails were coming in at about three dollars a lead, way too expensive. It, that probably wouldn't be sustainable for a crowdfunding campaign. And this is actually part of, you know, the next conversation of how do you do crowdfunding well? The dirty secret is it's paid traffic. It's almost all paid traffic now. Like you really can't rely on like, oh, it went viral. Like, no, that'll contribute 10% of your crowdfunding. Like if you're gonna break 50K, 100K in crowdfunding, you're gonna have to have a crazy amount of Facebook ads driving that. And you're probably not gonna make very much money on it. Um, but so you can run these ads though to validate. So for a new product we have for Will and Everett, that I'm really excited about. Uh, it's probably going to be live when this episode goes live. It's called Cold Brew on Tap. We um, we're running some validation ads right now, and we're getting leads for very inexpensive. So that tells us like this product is going to this is going to work really well. Um, so that's how I think people who have really good ideas can can at least validate if it's even worth their time to do that crowdfunding campaign because it's a lot of work. You don't want to go through the hassle of having the video made, the images, yeah. the copy. You don't know if it's going to you know, have a reasonable yeah. chance to succeed. I like how yeah. you talk about demystifying it a little bit because people are like, oh, he probably just put it up there and it went viral and he got like 180000 and, and the reality is it takes, first of all, orchestrating. We're not even talking about creating the product, right? That's, that's right. after all this stuff happens. But yeah. what features are going to be in it and everything like that, but orchestrating the actual getting people to see it. Um, and then I want you to, if you want to put a plug in for the product fuel, uh, if people want to check check it out if they're interested in seeing what you're doing. That's stuff that people can contact you for if they have innovative products. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so where, where can they find that? Or I'm, I'm kind of testing. Yeah, so it's productfuel.io and I'm okay. kind of just in beta test with this, kind of, you okay. know, trying to lean startup and see where where's the need, where's the interest, yeah. but helping people at any stage. The ultimate vision is to make an online accelerator, but mm -hmm. what I've found is I don't really like inventing the products as much as I do scaling, bringing yeah. them marketing but I know there's a lot of people out there that are the opposite they like inventing but they hate everything else so I'm trying to help those people um, who might have that idea yeah. that it, bring it to market okay. sell it online sell it on Amazon that sort of thing so people and also check out productfuel.io yeah. if they're interested whatever whatever iteration you're at with that they can check it out at this moment and, yeah. and shoot, see shoot what me a message is. there and yeah well, I'm just kind of like I said an information gathering stage so just having calls with people figuring out how I can be of help um, but yeah, so with the, the Kickstarter, though, the dirty secret, like I said, was is paid traffic. And on our own with the Terramat, we did a lot of hustling, a lot of blog outreach, you know, all the steps you might read, like go to Tim Ferriss's blog and you see like Kickstarter tips and you think like, wow, I've just spent hundreds of hours doing this. It's an 80-20 lover's nightmare. And as you do all these steps, you know, trying to share it, you know, get all these features, we raised $5,000 on our own. That's it. Like really abysmal for the amount of work we did. But what do we do? We turn to some paid traffic experts, and they really helped us climb um, to to the number we hit. And that's yeah. yeah, I guess the secret of crowdfunding. So thanks for sharing that, Ben. That's awesome. And what features did you include because of feedback? How did you come to this particular 
type of because I love the we help develop evolutionary products, not revolutionary products, right? So this is an evolutionary product. What mm-hmm. things did you find people were wanting from this? Um, for the for the Terramat, you mean? yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and, and my business partner did. Um, he's a mechanical engineer, just really good designer. So he brought in prototypes into his office and got a lot of feedback. But basically, found people like the ability to be able to do multiple poses, multiple stretches. Yeah, um, really liked having a feature where you could massage your feet. So we ended up putting two massage mounds on either side. And then there's a few others out there that have, like one has a giant blob in the middle, but people found that they actually trip over that. So we eliminated that. So the center mm-hmm. of it is you can do free moving, but right. it has like those nice um, ability to stretch. And we found Love people it. also yeah. would want to knead their feet. So we put some little, um, you know, texture on the front of it, on the yeah. foam roller type thing that allows you to really do that. Yeah. You can buy it on the Kickstarter page, right? Uh, so what, and that's the nice thing about Kickstarter, like it's, it's going to be solidified in page rankings on Google and so forth. But once the Kickstarter is over, you can just link them directly to your website. So okay. What, but there's a buy now. Yeah. So I, I encourage yeah. anyone to check it out. And, um, if they have a standing desk to buy it, cube fit, Terra mat, the ergonomic standing desk mat, and you can yeah. see you guys did an amazing job with the videos or the, the gifts, you know, you can see people using it and, um, it's fantastic. So yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, we love the product. It definitely changes your your life if you stand all day because it makes it a lot easier. Was it important to, like at that point, when you put the Kickstarter campaign up, where were you at with the prototyping? What do you suggest for, like how far along in the product development should someone be before putting up a Kickstarter campaign? So I guess it all depends on the company. Yeah. Um, but for us, we... Before we do a Kickstarter, we've already made the decision, are we going to launch this product or not? And then at that point, it's just a race to how quickly can we get it made. Mm-hmm. So usually what we're starting to do now is if we put a Kickstarter up, we're already starting to make it's the product. It's like, so like before maybe before 80% done or something. Like you're yeah. already further. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep, exactly. But if someone's like really trying to test, like, is this even worthwhile? Um, they might only have a very simple prototype. But what I'll say is a lot of times people will say, oh, I have to put the exact funding goals to what I want to raise, uh, you know, if I need to make this come true. But if you put a lower funding goal, once you get funded, you're more likely to show up in funded projects on Kickstarter and get more traffic. So it's actually better to put a lower funding goal, even if you actually need more than that. Yeah, because also if you don't hit it, you don't... You don't get anything. You don't get yeah. anything. Yeah. Right. At least at the time of this recording. Um, and so... So Ben, that's the I love the, the game plan before, right? Obviously, mm-hmm. you can do all the things that people teach, and it's going to take hundreds of hours, and it will help and get to five thousand. But really, the paid traffic lovers and things. But you validate it before then with the Amazon, the Google Trends data, and all this other stuff before you right. put it out there. But the paid traffic kind of push it over, so you need to have a game plan of doing anything before to budget that in, right? So what about yeah. after? What uh, what's important to do after? And if I can caveat that really quick, yeah, too, I ahead. think it's important to use volume, but I think there's also something special about you uniquely coming across a product idea and then using the um, data to validate it. So for the Terramat, my business partner stood all day, didn't um, move much, and had like a partial vein failure in his leg from not moving enough. So that was inspiration for making something that helps him move. And then we kind of used the data to validate like, okay, yeah. there's a lot, there would be a lot of demand for this product. Yes. Um, but nothing is substitution for, we'll put the uh, disclaimer for talking to actual customers or people who have yeah, problems. Right, yeah. right. Or just having, identifying the problem on your own. Um, and then, yeah, br- you know, bring it to market after a lot of validation. Yeah. But so, sorry, can you ask the, so after the, uh, the game plan after, so the game plan before, uh, so what you said, what most people don't have is a game plan after the Kickstarter. Right. Yeah. 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 So in the, the thing with, with Kickstarter is, as we found too, is you don't really make a lot of money from it. Unlike, like most people think, like I talked to, uh, these guys that I helped with, it was a campaign that I think raised like $15 million for a travel jacket. And you know, you might think, like, wow, they're just swimming in money. Apparently, like after everything, all the fees, ads, blah blah blah, they ended up clearing like a hundred k on that, like really terrible margin. So you really need a game plan in place to. Um, it's free. Lead, it's free lead generation. I it, mean, exactly, exactly, and it builds a really loyal customer base. I'm always shocked at how responsive our Qfit Terramat backers are, and they're just amazing because they help bring the product to life, and they really believe in what you're doing. So just a great resource to either launch a company from or make it a lot stronger, but you need something in place to really then like 
make the money for the business after the right. after the Kickstarter. So what we found is there's an amazing potential to do this Kickstarter to Amazon brand because there's a ton of traffic on Amazon. And once you have Kickstarter, not only do you get the halo effect, but now you have a lot of social credibility on Amazon that makes you stand out. Um, not to mention the trust of Amazon as a platform. It can be very difficult to convince someone to buy your new widget on your random Shopify store versus Amazon. Amazon has the highest conversions. This doesn't work with all products, but it works with a lot. We've had a lot of success doing this with Terramat and some of the other products we have in the works. So that's part of Product Fuel's sweet spot right now is helping other companies bridge that Kickstarter to Amazon gap. There's also, you know, obviously launching on your own store can work pretty well. Um, you're just going to probably bleed a lot of potential customers because they're not going to trust your store necessarily as much um, yeah. as they would. Amazon. A lot but of I think, trust on Amazon. They're already shopping there. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yep. yep. But I think having both up is uh, is pretty important. But it's like it's like anything, right? Like I could say, hey, yeah, you should definitely run paid ads for your Kickstarter campaign. I would not recommend trying to go out and figure out Facebook ads. Like that takes years to get to get right. So it's finding out who is world class in this and then bring them on your team. That's what we did for Kickstarter. It's what we're doing for our current Kickstarter. We have an amazing guy that's. Um, even helping with the validation is going to launch the Kickstarter for us. So same thing with Amazon, like either become world class or get you know some world class expertise. And then same with your e-commerce store. One of my friends actually runs a company that helps Kickstarters sell on their e-commerce platforms, you know, for a cut, but they help them do way more than that company could ever do on their own. So I think it's finding who is the best in this industry and how can I work with them. It's the whole notion of would you rather have a very small pie to yourself or would you rather have you know right. a lot. Well, a huge pie. I'd always much rather have yeah. several slices of a huge pie. Some people would think, well, if they have like more of a scarcity, like, well, I don't mm -hmm. want to hire someone because they don't want to take or I don't have to pay them a lot of money. But then without them, you wouldn't be making all that money type of thing. It, it, and that's why the best people only do rev share. And like this guy who runs this e-commerce company, they're actually called uh, Madex Labs. He's a great guy. So I'll, just, I'll mention that. But they take a cut of rev share. So mm -hmm. they're, you know, if you What's get. What's it called? How do you, how do you spot Matix Labs, um, Matix, yeah, M A T I X Labs dot com, Matix Labs. So they will run your e commerce store, but they only target people who have had successful Kickstarters, and they just take a cut of revenue. So if you're, they're not getting sales, they're not getting paid, and that's actually how I'm kind of structuring my experiment right now for helping other people on Amazon, and that's how the people who have done our ads for um, the Kickstarters also structure it, and I think it's just a win win because. If you're getting money, they're getting money. If you know they're not, you're not. So it's it's yeah. Right. So if you have a bunch of customers coming into Matrix Labs, you should give Ben a cut of that because he just <laughs> refers you a couple people. But um, thanks, Ben. So anything after? So obviously there needs to be that game plan. So are there certain levers to get the traffic to Amazon, or is it just a simple thing like putting the making sure it's it's the buy now is going over to Amazon? What what things should someone be thinking about doing? So great question. I actually wrote a blog post on that. The only blog post on product fuel that I have written so far because I got way too busy. But I kind of talk about like the top seven steps you should do when trying to you know go from an awesome Kickstarter crowdfunding campaign to Amazon. Um, and yeah, it's 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 several you know simple steps like um, taking advantage of the social proof by having your Amazon listing really tell people like, hey, this thing did great on Kickstarter. Having your video up, redirecting your link on the Kickstarter page to either Amazon or mm. landing page where then shoot people yeah. in the coupon. And then it's targeting keywords. Because at the end of the day, Amazon only works if you can get your product ranking for those extremely high volume keywords. Right. So yeah, so it doesn't work for all products, but if your product is a fit, there can be massive opportunities. Yeah, I mean, you point out two things on this on the post, which is the two, I mean, we don't really know the algorithm, but I mean, am, you know, reviews are huge, right, with ranking, and then sales mm -hmm. velocity is huge, or pro and product ranking keywords. So the two you mentioned, which probably people don't think about doing, is emailing all your backers and having them leave a review on Amazon, right? That's it, that's big. Yeah, it, that's so. There's a company right now I'm helping. They're called Wilcox Boots. Amazing boots. They just did this uh, Kickstarter campaign, or not just, but like a year or so ago. It went really well. And we had them send out an email to their backers. They got 150 reviews in like one day. <laughs> Amazing. And because and everyone loves the product. So instant social proof from that. So that's, it's a, that's again, why yeah. I, I love this Kickstarter to Amazon or to your yeah. store. Because it's, yeah. It's low-hanging fruit that mm -hmm. they would not have even, some people wouldn't even think of that produces huge results for them. And it just means writing one email. Right. Yep. So, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So check it out productfuel.io and then there's 
it's like top five secrets to a successful uh, su successfully sell your crowdfunding product on Amazon. Um, so Ben, we talked about researching products and especially for Kickstarter. Um, what about, do you do it differently than if it's just launching on your site in Amazon than Kickstarter? You know, uh, the, cause you do the, mm -hmm. um, you know, Google trends, so you do the Amazon sales, you do some testing and ads. Is there a different process for if you're just launching it on your site in Amazon than Kickstarter or is it the same? A uh, different launch process or validation? Yeah, a uh, different validation process for new product. Because not uh, every I, product you release on Kickstarter, you know, some you're, you're just yeah, releasing on Amazon and yourself. Yeah, that, that's fair. Yeah, um, so I think for Kickstarter, it's, does it have the, you're kind of looking for that, a little bit of a wow factor. You know, like, is it instant gratification, like someone's like season, like I love that. Because some of our products are a little more utilitarian and boring, yeah. and I, I just know it, it would not do well at all on Kickstarter. Yeah. But it's still validated because we can still see strong demand and we know it's a better product that will launch it. Yeah. Um, but I, and I think that's kind of where like the art, you know, to the science counterpart comes in is you kind of got to give your best guess and, you know, use some intuition. And sometimes, you know, we're still wrong, but that's why you do the validation. Cause at the end of the day, yeah. it's all about, is it the right product or not? You can do all the right steps, but it's either the right product or it's not. Mm -hmm. Talk about launching. So I know you have like a 72 step process for launching. What are some of the most important <laughs> things when launching a product? Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, and a lot of that is following our best practices is, is just, as far as just like ensuring product quality, you know, dealing with all the logistics, the inspections. Um, and then once it's getting ready uh, to actually go live, uh, you know, on our website and on Amazon. Um, but we try to, we have our own kind of uh, VIP group that will give, the product to to start kind of testing out getting mm. feedback on it and then uh it's also important on amazon specifically to get a lot of initial exposure quickly so we'll use um some launch sites that can kind of help get our product out there for a uh, lower price but then it can really help it climb the keyword rankings fast and then it's you know getting just trying to drive as much traffic as you can so we're driving it from our own list from our facebook page from other people's launch services and then turning on Amazon ads and just trying to like, you know, send as much to the listing at once as you can. But on top of that, you need to make sure that you're in a highly converting state. So you need to have amazing images, good copy, you know, all the, I guess, basic e-commerce um, stuff, doing really good keyword research to know what you even mm -hmm. care about. Um, and uh, what was the biggest mistake you were making? I mean, there's a long list now, but when you were starting, you've built this out over time. What's mm -hmm. the big, biggest mistake you were making and you feel other people are making that when you change made the biggest difference. Like, I don't know, if it, I'm not saying it is, but like, for example, like actually just putting high quality images and images that are people using the product as opposed to just the product. Yeah. So what have been the biggest levers as far as the mistakes you were making and once you put it in place, it produced the most results for you? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, so I, I'd say, yeah, maybe one of the big ones actually is I think a lot of people overlook images. Like, you know, retail is changing rapidly. A lot of stores are going bankrupt and just the whole nature of commerce is shifting but there's something a lot different about buying it on your computer than going to the store and be able to interact with it, turn it around. So what people forget is like the customer wants to know like, how does this product actually work? What does it look like? So what we found is, and this has been developing over time, but by putting as many lifestyle images as possible and just really helping try to bring the customer into like the story of like, how is your product being used? What are the different you know features? Like for example, one of our teapots, we'll show it um, steeping in the tea. We'll show it, you know, maybe being microwave at one point, showing kind of the different like ways that you can use it, having a really attractive model, pouring it with their friends, just trying to tie the consumer into that story. We find that really helps conversions and makes someone a lot more likely to buy versus seven yeah. different images, uh, you know, that just show it from various angles on a white background. Like no one, that doesn't really help the consumer in any way. Yeah. But yeah, there's, I guess, a lot of other tips I could think of, but that's maybe one of the one of the big ones that I think kind of gets overlooked, and a lot of people don't want to spend money on images because it does cost a lot, but it's just an investment that pays dividends if you do it right. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I've seen you guys do on your site is just the animated GIF um, that most people aren't doing. I mean, the, even the Kickstarter, the TerraMat example, like, yeah, you know, if you said, oh, calf stretch, <laughs> I'm like, okay, cool, calf stretch. But then if you show like an animated GIF of someone actually doing a calf stretch, it's, it means so much more. It's so it's so much better. Yeah. Yeah. So I yeah, love like, that you guys do that. It's in demo. Yeah. Yep. And same with, you know, video. You know, very beneficial as well. So, Ben, um, we talked a lot about, and 
for I think for productfield.io, I, I'm on, I'm going to put my vote in iteration. Um, you know what's interesting is as a veteran, uh, you know someone. It's really interesting how people transitioning after their service. What do they do? You know what mm. I mean? There's probably a big, big population of like they're not sure, like transitioning into so civilianhood or whatever you call it. You know, it's interesting. Probably a lot of those people have ideas. Um, it's like you could even get so far in niching down into helping those people, those people have product ideas while they're in service, develop them. So when they get out, they have like a sustainable business waiting for them. So yeah. I, don't know, I think about that for your, your product fuel as a, as a really niched service. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's a really, I, I really like that. So, because I am passionate about helping, uh, helping other vets. And there are a few services that do that, but I think to really help empower yeah. the inventor. So, um, yeah. Uh, think about that for a second. I, I was just thinking, and, and I want to talk about, I know we have a couple minutes, you have another meeting coming up, but um, I don't like to leave it just on the up. I like to hear about some of the challenges, you know what I mean? Because yeah. the reality is there's ups and downs to this. Um, what have been some of the, the challenges or the, the down pieces? Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely have been a lot of those. You know, entrepreneurship's a roller coaster. And I think it's trying to, you know, not get too far down when, when things aren't going well. Um, so what's been, uh, a, I guess, I like to end it in Spurred Insider with um, what's been a low moment business-wise and then what's mm -hmm. been a, like a super proud moment for you? Yeah, so I think a low moment is, or, or just, you know, a difficulty is having so much going on that you start feeling burned out or like you can do all the systemizing you want, but it, it's just, it's a constant process. And right now I've a little bit off a little too much that I can chew. We actually launched a third business, kind of replicating some of what we're doing, um, but I'm starting to feel kind of like split with, between two many different things. So I'm, I'm wanting to, I think, prune some of that down. And then I think as you do that, you start to, um, I know sometimes I'll just be a little short with people or, um, you know, just like feeling from the pressure and patient. And, and so I think it's kind of trying to deal with, you know, the quote busyness and like yeah. the one thing says you need to embrace the chaos that ensues by just doing your major things because then there's gonna be a lot of you little stuff that's kind of floating out there like, Oh, I didn't clear out my inbox today. You know, not the end of the world if you don't do that, but yeah. I still feel that pressure as a yeah. perfectionist to get it done. Um, it kind of, you feel like sometimes it's leaked into your, your personal or social in social situations. F fantastic point. Yep, I, I'm I'm really trying hard right now to kind of keep it compartmentalized. Like when I go home, at, you know, at six from from the WeWork, I'm I'm leaving work behind. I'm not talking about it, and I'm really trying to do a better job with that on weekends because I see a lot of entrepreneurs that yeah. reach into their life. It's done that to me for the last six months to a year, and I'm I'm kind of done with it. So yeah, yeah. I wish we had more time because I want to hear because your spouse is obviously part of the business, so yeah, it, it's, that's even harder to cut out. Yeah, you know what? I can actually my next meeting. I can be like ten minutes late. So I, let me. Yeah, we can we can keep chatting if if you want. To yeah, you. for sure. Um, because then it's like, okay, how do you even shut things off? And how do you your your spouse is part of the business? That's I would think really tough to navigate. So if you need to send a message, go ahead and do your thing. But uh, I'd love to explore that a little bit because I'm sure people have family or friends or spouses in the business with them and how you navigate that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's um, it's a double-edged sword. It's awesome being able to do it with your spouse on one hand because, you know, you're doing this together. You know, you know each other really well. We happen to complement each other in a lot of ways um, in the business. Um, she's good at things I'm terrible at and vice versa. But it's also a big challenge because now, you know, for a while, actually, I was kind of giving her tasks almost. Like I had a trailer board and I was putting cards on her board and I quickly learned – that is a really bad idea to treat your wife like an employee. Learn the hard way. But what so that say? was um, well, just like she's just you know, I can tell just like kind of getting you know upset that I was telling her what to do, and then would just be like super late on deadlines, and you know there's just a lot of stress from that. And, I, and you know I had this moment where I was like you know this is not like it's not even worth having a business that's going to succeed if it means your marriage is going to suffer. And so we ended up hiring a market manager that. I could then, you know, treat as an employee and then allow her to do what she wanted. But I think mm. it's important to have clear. You just called the market manager, like, put this on her trailer board. No, I'm just. 
<laughs> yeah, no, no. So Julia, you no, she, not me. No, yeah. no, yeah, she he he does her task now that I was giving her. Yeah, that would be funny. Have someone else do it because then she won't say no. Look, I just hired a person to put stuff on her trouble. <laughs> Can't get mad at her. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think what what we're really, really trying to do, and I know you know you you think about this a lot, is how can you have a healthy you know um you know, marriage while running the businesses is I'm trying to keep things very compartmented. So if we go out, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to have one awesome date night a week where we don't talk about business or problem solve, trying to not talk about business on weekends. Um, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. And I kind of had my eyes open up even just a few months ago where I was just so busy, you know, in survival mode, so to speak, running these businesses while being in the Air Force, finally got out of the Air Force, had breathing room, but found out all my habits had been established at that point. It's like, oh, crap. So I kind of had like a a rude awakening and thankfully my wife was very gracious but kind of helped me understand like hey you are like being way too consumed by these businesses mm. um and we I, you know something i actually would highly recommend is uh, see a marriage counselor like i i don't think there's no shame in that i think it's very healthy and i think it should be a regular part of people's lives to see a counselor because they find um things that you you you, you don't know about you you know we all have um blind spots so we've done that yeah. a few times that's incredibly life-giving mm. build a talk what did you learn from that Oh man, I I learned a well, I, I learned a lot. I, I learned that I, I can be um, there. I can be selfish, and um, I learned that uh, you know I think I was making this excuse for like, oh, I gotta provide for the family. I gotta gotta provide for us, um, but was kind of just using that to fuel my own ambition and, and taking a step back. It's like okay, you know, God's blessed us to the point where we're doing this full time. We can you know have more than enough money to eat, you know, buy a house, etc. Now I'm just kind of pursuing a number like, oh, seven figures isn't enough. Let's go for eight figures. Let's go for, you know, and it's like, that's not worth it. You know, like if you just pursue success for success sake, like it, it's so empty. So I, it kind of helped me realize like that's what I was doing. Like I was no longer just trying to provide for our family. I was just on a runaway, you know, you know, success <laughs> rant, I guess you could say. So, um, yeah, that, that was pretty huge. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. We'll let your wife hear that so she knows you're selfish and you get extra points <laughs> for admitting that. Uh, yes, Lee, I'm selfish too. Um, my wife is a clinical psychologist, so uh, yes, I, you know there is a lot of uh, time and place for for people to get the seek, and it makes perfect sense. Like people have business coaches, then oftentimes we don't do coaching for our some of our relationships. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. That, and actually, on that note, what I'll say too is, I, I, what I find is, if I'm constantly filling my head with business this, business that, then that's all I think about. Mm -hmm. And part of the shift has been like, hey, I'm going to start also learning about like how do you become, you know, become an have an awesome husband. How do you have an awesome marriage? Because it, it does take work. And just like you know, building a business, you kind of have to build your marriage. So at least put some thought into it. You can't just expect it to happen. You know, but I didn't realize that until the last you know few months, really concretely. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah. You know, thanks for sharing that, Ben, because that's obviously very personal. Um, so on the the last thing, last question, Ben, what's been the, one of the proudest moments so far for you? So I'm, I'm actually trying to work on not being prideful. So mm. uh, <laughs> dangerous question. No. So I, I guess what I'll say is I'm. Maybe I'll, I'll say grateful moments. Okay, and, grateful. And, you know, grateful is good. But, um, I'm really grateful. And I guess, you know, I'm proud of the hard work that my wife did, I did, and then our, our team will never to kind of take this dream of, you know, after Hilo and everything, and I was just discouraged. But I loved entrepreneurship and, you know, really wanting to do it full time. And, you know, praying like, God, would you let me be a full time entrepreneur? And then, you know, he answered it. And here, you know, May 22nd, 2017, I was able to leave the Air Force be a full-time entrepreneur and I, you know, I really hope I can do it for the rest of my life. And uh, that was just like an amazing, like, I, didn't, I didn't really think that was possible that I could be running businesses on, on my own like that, especially um, fairly soon. But I'm just really grateful that, um, yeah, that God blessed it. And that, yeah. you know, we all worked hard to, to make it happen. So yeah, thanks for sharing Ben. And where should we point people towards online? Um, I know I men mentioned productfuel.io. Any other places we should point people towards to find out more about you and what you're doing? Uh, yeah, product fuel dio. Oh, I can't pronounce it. Product fuel .io would be good, and especially I didn't mention this, but I'm really interested in becoming potentially an investor in small, up and coming, innovative brands. So I'd love to connect with innovative brands or inventors, and then also anyone who maybe is an investor and kind of how 
you know, they do that because I'm looking to learn more about this area. So pryfuel.io, but then also um, willowandeverett.com mm-hmm. is our high-end kitchen brand. And then cubefit.com is uh, the healthy office um, brand. Where should, should they connect with you if they have interest on productfuel.io or where should we send people uh, for that? Yeah, there's. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I have a, I have a contact okay. form in there. Uh, you, you know, there's uh, several. Uh, I think on that one, I just put a Gmail one, ben.arnenberg okay. at gmail.com. Okay. But you can reach me at like ben at willownever.com or add me on LinkedIn. Okay. Mm-hmm. Ben, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for breaking down all these processes so thoroughly. I really appreciate it. People should check out productfuel.io, Will and Everett, or CubeFit. It's been awesome. Hey, thanks so much, Jeremy. It's been an honor. Hope to see you at uh, Rising... Uh, Rise 25, exactly. Yeah, 25. It sounds awesome. So awesome. I'd love to come. Cool. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.